Psalm chapter one. Well, what's going on here? There it is. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor seats in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf shall also not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly, but the ungodly are not so. They are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the seed of the congregation or the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Take your song books, please. Turn to 200. Two hundred. We're going to do this a little bit differently. We're going to put the chorus at the very last. 200. Hallelujah. Praise Jehovah. From the heavens, praise his name. Praise Jehovah in the highest. All his angels praise proclaim. All his hosts together praise him. Sun, moon, and stars on high. Praise him, O ye heaven of heavens, and ye floods above the sky. Let them praises give Jehovah. They were made at his command. Them forever he established. His decree shall ever stand. From the earth, oh, praise Jehovah. All oh, your blood, you dragons, all. Oh. Fire and hail and snow and vapors. Stormy winds that hear him call. All ye fruitful trees and cedars, all ye hills and mountains high, creeping things and beasts and cattle, boats that in the heavens fly. From the earth, oh, praise people, princes, greater judges all. Praise his name, young men and maidens, aged men and children small. Let them praise his give Jehovah, for his name alone is high. And his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted. And his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. 249. Actually, would you please uh, ignore that one and let's go to 977. Sorry about that. 977. I meant to change that, and I forgot to do that. It's what happens when you get to be an old man like me. 977. Let's 
In heavenly armor will enter the land. The battle belongs to the Lord. No weapons that fashioned against us will stand. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. When the power of darkness comes in like a flood, the battle belongs to the Lord. He's raised up a standard, the power of his blood. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. When your enemy presses in hard, do not fear. The battle belongs to the Lord. He's there, my friend, your redemption is near. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. Would you please mark 454? 454. You will take the sheets I gave you. They will go along with the PowerPoint this morning. And you get to cheat a little bit. <clears throat> Not that I wanted you to cheat. I just figured that was the better way to do it. If you'll take your Bibles and let's concentrate on 2 Chronicles chapter 32. Now you can read 2 Chronicles 19 with that if you want to. But to keep from going back and forth and, and talking about the same thing, let's just limit our time to 2 Chronicles 32. We have been talking about for the last few weeks the premise that God told Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles 20 and verse 15. The battle is not yours. The battle is God's. We've been singing that consistently before the lesson the battle belongs to the lord dan rouse who was the former preacher at fort gibson oklahoma church of christ and still attends there and was preaching this morning made a, a very good observation probably not the first time he's made it probably not going to be the last time he's made it but he said we're all on a spiritual journey and if we're all on a spiritual journey there is a way to get home. When I was growing up, this, this idea in Hebrews chapter 12 about a race to me was one of these where you take and you go and you run and it's straight and it's all good and there's nothing, nothing dangerous, anything about it. And yet when I would, as a Christian, I would fall and stumble and I didn't want to get up. And I was so, as Ray Stevens would say, pretty dad burnt disillusioned, to tell you the truth. And then come to find out, guess what? This race that he speaks of in Hebrews chapter 12 is not a straight race. My mentor, Ardren Hinton, said it is more like potholes and landmines. It's more like a cross-country race. And the reason is, is because we have an enemy who wants very much for us to fall and to stumble. And he wants us to throw away what we have. Well, what you have here in 2 Chronicles 32 is the potential, the potential for God's people to no longer be God's people. He's already taken and allowed the 10 northern tribes, those are the tribes of Samaria, we call them Israel, to be taken away by this man named Sennacherib. The world power is Assyria. The capital is Nineveh. And Assyria was a cruel people. It's one of the reasons when Jonah writes what he writes and God says, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Jonah just couldn't wait. He just loved it because nobody liked Nineveh. 
Nobody liked Assyria. They were a cruel, arrogant, prideful people. <clears throat> what they're doing is, is that they are going to defeat another enemy. They're going to take another enemy and they're going to beat him. So they think. And so it is that he's already warned, Hezekiah has already warned. He's already warned the people. Whatever he says, whatever he does, don't flinch. Don't move. Stay right where you're supposed to be. And so what we understand is this enemy is huge. This enemy is so big and so huge that no matter how big the enemy is, we need to remember God is greater. Now, what am I talking about? Go to chapter 32. Look with me at verse number one. After these deeds of faithfulness, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and entered Judah. He encamped against the fortified cities, thinking to win them over to himself. And when Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib had come and that his purpose was to make war against Jerusalem, he consulted with his leaders and commanders to stop the water from the springs which were outside the city, and they helped him. Thus many people gathered together who stopped all the springs in the brook that ran through the land, saying, Why should the kings of Assyria come and find such water? And he strengthened himself, built up all the wall that was broken, raised it up to the towers, built another wall outside, and he repaired the Milo in the city of David and made weapons and shields in abundance. And he set military captains over the people, gathered them together in the open square of the city gate and gave them encouragement saying, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed before the king of Assyria, nor before all the multitude that is with him. For there are more with us than there are with him. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people were strengthened with the words of Hezekiah. I hope you heard that word, that phrase, the one I emphasize, there are more with us than there are with him. Wonder where he learned that. Maybe he learned that from Elisha. Back in 2 Kings chapter 6, I keep referring back to it because it just fits so well. I hope you don't get tired of it. And here is Elisha, who is the prophet of God in the land of Samaria, the 10 northern tribes. And here he is, and he's telling the king of Israel everything that Benadad, the king of Syria, not Assyria, different nation, is saying. Well, every time Benadad would get together, that's the king of Assyria. Every time he'd try to fight the king of Israel, he lose. Well, he's so frustrated, he can't figure out what's going on. And so he asked his advisors, he says, why in the world is this happening? And they said, oh, I'm going to paraphrase this, but it's biblical. Well, duh. There's a prophet named Elisha. Who's who hears everything you say, even in your own bedroom, and he goes and tells the king of Israel. And then Benadad goes, well, where is he? And they went, duh, he lives in Dothan. Now, I know you're not going to find duh there, but that's really what they're telling him. And he sends this enormous army. And, the, and his servant goes, what are we going to do? Do you see what's going on? And I said, what do you mean what's going on? He said, do you see that enormous army? He said, there's more with us than there are with him. Lord opened his eyes and the Lord opened his eyes and he said, all he could see around the top of the mountain was horses and chariots. And he said, and there were so many. And when they got close enough, God, God through Elisha blinded the Syrians. And the king of Israel says, well, shall we kill them? Nope, you're going to feed them. You're going to give them something to drink. You're going to fix a big banquet for them. And then when it's all over with, you're going to send them home. 
Now that's the biblical definition of revenge. Romans chapter 12, verse 20 and 21. It didn't cost you anything either. First Peter 4, verse 12 through 16. Peter says, if you suffer as a Christian, you should not be ashamed of that. Because they're going to be people that think you're a weirdo. They're going to think I'm weird. Because I don't do the things, you don't do the things that they do. You don't go drinking, for example. You don't go get high on, on illegal drugs. You don't go partying. You don't do any of that stuff. Nothing wrong with partying. I didn't say that. But you know what I mean by partying. You ruin your influence if you do. This is why it's so dangerous in our day and time, because what people do, they're, oh, what do you think, you're too good for us? You think you're goody two-shoes? Well, they've always said that about me. No, I'm not, I'm not any better than anybody else. But what I do know is, if I do those things you want me to do, and I try to teach you the gospel, are you going to listen to me? The answer is no. Peter said, if any man suffers, let him suffer as a Christian, but don't let him be ashamed of it. That's why John wrote, and we studied this the other night, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Um, I tell you, I'm not sure about that, brother. I'm not sure about that, preacher. Why? Why? Have you been seeing what's going on on television? My wife gives me a hard time because I won't watch much news. And the reason I don't watch much news, I'd rather read it because at least that doesn't depress me as much as watching it. I will watch a little bit. And I found News Nation now is a pretty good balance between, because if you want, if you want the, if you can't stand, for example, Donald Trump, go watch CNN. If you love Donald Trump, go watch Fox, okay? That's just kind of the, the bias that's in it. News Nation now kind of gives you the, the balance. And, and, it's, and it's just unreal that the evil that's in the world. Paul said it was going to do this in 2 Timothy 2. I don't know why we're surprised. He said the mystery of lawlessness grows and grows and grows. And there are things that, you know, when I was growing up, and some of you have probably heard this, well, I thought I'd seen everything. I used to say that. I quit saying that because you know what? I haven't seen everything. If I told you some things that kids have done at school, you'd be going to the bathroom up chucking. If, you'd, if, you, if I told you some things that happened with adults, you'd be like, you got to be kidding. You're making that up. Are you sure that God is greater? Are you sure that God is so, so much greater than all of that? Absolutely. 1 John 4, 4, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Want proof? What's the end of the book of the Bible all about? The end of the Bible is not about a war that you've been lied to, that there's going to be Armageddon, that all hell's going to break loose. You know how big Armageddon is? It's about maybe a two by three foot. Now, how are you going to get two? How are you going to get all these uh, people that's ever existed in the world on a two foot by three foot pad? That symbolized war to people. That's what that, that's what Revelation is talking about, Armageddon or Megiddo. That's not what the book of Revelation ends up being. It ends up being a victory in Jesus with one caveat, you're still invited to come. You're still invited to come. What a great invitation. And it seems like that the enemy is so enormous, but God's greater. God's so much bigger because number two, no matter how big the intimidation, God is always greater. Go to chapter 32, verse number nine. After this, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, sent his servants to Jerusalem, but he and all his forces with him laid siege against Lachish. To Hezekiah, king of Judah, to all Judah who, way, who were in Jerusalem, thus says the, the uh, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, 
in what do you trust that you remain under siege in Jerusalem? Does not Hezekiah persuade you to give yourselves over to die by famine and by thirst, saying the Lord our God will deliver us from the hand of the king of Assyria? Has not the same Hezekiah taken away his high places and his altars, commanded Judah and Jerusalem, saying you shall worship before one altar and burn incense on it? Do you not know what I and my fathers have done to all the peoples of the other lands in, in, in uh, uh, other lands were the gods of the nations of those lands in any way able to deliver their lands out of my hand who was there among all the gods of the nations that my fathers utterly destroyed that could deliver his people from my God that your God should be able to deliver from my hand now therefore do not let Hezekiah deceive you or persuade you like this and do not believe him for no God of any nation or kingdom was able to deliver his people from my hand and the hand of my fathers. How much less will your God deliver you from my hand? Verse 16, furthermore, his servant spoke against the Lord God and against his servant Hezekiah. He also wrote letters to revile the Lord God of Israel and to speak against him as the gods of other nations have not delivered their people from my hand. So the God of Hezekiah will not deliver his people from my hand. Then they called out with a loud voice in Hebrew to the people of Jerusalem who were on the wall to frighten them and to trouble them that they might take the city. And they spoke against the God of Jerusalem as against the gods of the people of the earth, the work of men's hands. And don't miss how many times Jeremiah or Ezra told you that, that they spoke against God. It was no trouble for him to do that. It was no trouble for him to say the things against God. Remember what Psalm 37, 12 and 13 says? That the nations are going to rage, that the nations are going to say evil things. They're going to say, they're going to use their mouths to try to intimidate. They're going to try to intimidate. And they've got all of the tools in the toolbox for you to see. See, the problem for us is sometimes we can't see what God is doing. You see, we get in a storm like this, or we get in a big storm, and we question like Job. We question like John the baptizer. God, are you really doing your job? Jesus, are you really the one we're looking for, or do we look for another? You begin to get doubts because you can't see what God is doing, but make no mistake about it. God is doing something. Well, what's he doing? Got me. I have no idea what he's doing. I just know he's doing it. And he is so much greater than any intimidation. What is Satan's MO? Satan's MO is 2 Timothy 1 and verse 7. When Paul told Timothy, he starts off his ministry. And he says, and, and one of Timothy's problems is, is he's afraid. You know what the greatest fear of males are? They'll run up, uh, run up down the highway buck naked before they'll stand up here what I'm doing right now. Do you know that? It intimidates because you are seen. And yet I tell people all the time. Life is a series of presentations, and I can't remember the author's name, but you're seen all the time. Why is it that when we get in a setting like this, that if I ask somebody to come up and, and preach it, no, 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 not me, no, 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 no. No, no, I can't do that. You know, give me to do something else, but I can't do that. How about lead singing? Oh, no, I can't do that. And I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying there's the fear. So what did Paul tell Timothy? God has not given us a spirit of fear. Now, the fear of which we're speaking is not reverence to God. It's, it's letting the fear keep you from doing what God said. You cannot believe 
the amount of people who used to criticize me, condemn me because I said, we should never give in to this fear about COVID. Well, you just want people to die. No, I don't. I don't want people to get sick. But if you treat it like the flu, you're not going to get sick. What do we do, though? We got so afraid, by the way, they did all these same things in the, in the 19-teens and the 1920s. One of my favorite pictures that I'm still trying to find is of men at the World Series in 1919, and they're all wearing what? A mask. They're wearing a mask. Do you know for the first time, and I'll defend, I'll defend to a point this, this idea about COVID. Do you know for the first time, I never heard one case about the flu. Did anybody hear about the flu? I didn't hear it. My doctor kept telling me I need a flu shot. And I'm thinking to myself, why do I need a flu shot? I haven't heard anything about the flu this year. Oh, well, it's still around. And I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but what we did was we let fear keep us from doing what God said to do. He did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. And the new CDC regulations that are coming out are going to tell you that even if you have COVID, you can go to school. Did you hear me? Even if you have COVID, you can go to school. All you have to do is wear a mask. Well, I wonder who said that about two years ago. You're looking at him, and this is not arrogance, folks. What this is, is we let fear do keep us from doing, oh, man, I can't go to church. I, I can't study the Bible. You know, I can't even open this book because, I don't know, somebody may have touched it. I'm not making this stuff up, people. What I'm telling you is we need to make sure that we keep fear in check. Does it? Is there anything wrong with fear? No, not, not that. I mean, it, there's a healthy amount of fear we should have. For example, when we get behind the wheel, I get afraid when my daughter drives. Guess what? She gets afraid when I drive. But do we still get in the vehicle? Yeah. I mean, she drives too fast. She says, I drive too slow. We kind of laugh about it. But we let fear dominate us. And we just got out the test scores, and I still do not believe this has anything to do with COVID as much as the isolation that we forced our kids into. Test scores are at an all-time low. In reading. You know why? Because we couldn't get kids to read. We would send kids home with these hot spots, and they're great hot spots, and they needed them. But if they were on video, they couldn't stay with me. The hot spot wasn't big enough. The bandwidth wasn't big enough. They didn't want to be on video, secondly, because they were intimidated. And when, the, when we went back to, to um, for about two weeks, went back to remote, you have never seen kids going out of a school building so depressed because they don't have the interaction. And this is what we did to church, people. The Bible talks about fellowship. I know I'm on a soapbox a minute, but give me a break here. We talk about fellowship. We talk about fellowship. And what did we do? No. We're not going to fellowship with you. We're not going to, because you may have COVID. Oh, wait a minute. Is there a thing called the common cold? I used to get colds all the time. Found out my vitamin C was real low, so my chili has helped me out a bunch. Thank you, guys. I never had anybody get away from me because I had a cold. Was I contagious? Yeah. And then my cruel dad made me go and sift wheat or uh, scoop wheat for about two hours. And then I was sick for two weeks. Almost killed him then. Come to find out, guess what I'm allergic to? Corn, soy, and wheat. <laughs> Folks, what I'm getting at, and I hope you don't misunderstand my intentions, is who are the people 
who are going to end up in hell. They are the cowardly. That's not all the categories that are listed there. I know, Revelation 21, 8. But what does he talk about? God is so much greater. What do these people in the book of Revelation need to hear? God's going to win. You got to stay with God. You got to stay with God. You got to stay with God. I've read of congregations that went from 150 pre-COVID down to 30. That's a big blow. And they're not coming back. They're not coming back because they're still afraid that there's the possibility of getting. I don't want anybody to get sick. I don't want anybody to die. That's not the point. But don't let the devil trick you into something you shouldn't trick you into. Sennacherib says, there's no God I have ever defeated. And don't think this God is ever going to save you. Boy, that sounded very familiar to me when I read that. Kind of just like our enemy, devil. Because number three, there's always going to be reminders of your mistakes. Wait just a minute. Now, look, look, at, what, look at what happened, verse uh, 17. As the gods of the, of the nations of other lands have not delivered these people from my hand, so the God of Hezekiah will not deliver you from, the, from his people from my hand. They called to, to get them afraid. They called out to them. What, what is in the previous chapters, especially in 1 Kings 18 is, or 2 Kings 18, sorry, is that Hezekiah paid Sennacherib a tribute. The tribute he paid was from the gold in the temple. And Sennacherib says, wait a minute, he's already paid me a tribute. If this God who you claim is supposed to be the God of all gods and, and God's going to deliver, you know, what about that you did a while ago? What about that when you paid me the tribute from the temple of that God you claim is supposed to be perfect and right and up holy and all this? Let me tell you, our enemy always wants us to live in the past. And I know I know how appealing it is to live in the past. Solomon says, don't do it. The good old days. I liked what two ladies down at m &A said one day. One was talking to the other one. and She says, you know, I miss the good old days. And the second one says, well, what do you mean? She said, I miss the good old days when family was family. And, you know, you, you know, we had Andy Griffith on TV and all this stuff. She says, hey, she said, these are the good old days. And the first one says, what do you mean? She says, we've got dishwashers. We've got microwaves. We've got washing machines. She says, I don't know how you wash clothes, but I had a family of six and I had to wash them by a washboard. And I had to take that lye soap that'll burn your hand. Do you have to do that? It's called POV, point of view. Satan will always remind you of your mistakes. You remember when you, uh, remember when you uh, said uh, about uh, a preacher and he led singing and he led singing too high and his wife and daughter were sitting two seats from you? Yeah, I remember that like it was yesterday. I just told you. You remember when um, when you got called a Springer cow? That's why your name's Springer. You you remember you remember why you remember when uh, you you insulted a, a Christian sister and she didn't know that you guys were just clowning around. She played around with it, but you know you're a jerk. And I was being a jerk, and I didn't know it. And I went and apologized to that girl. And I said, we're not doing that anymore. And she said, well, thank you. And I said, I didn't realize it bothered you because you were getting right back and just, just as, quote, insulting as we were, unquote. But I didn't know it bothered you. And she turned around and she said, well, that's okay. I said, no, it's not okay. I appreciate you accepting my apology and it won't happen again. And sure enough, she says, you know what? You're, you, you kept your word, didn't you? And I said, yeah. And see, all these things 
keep coming up. There's an interesting passage found in Proverbs 24, 16. And what Solomon tells us is, who are the people of God and who are not? He gives us a real test. The righteous will fall seven times. Now, he says, if the righteous fall seven times, let me, let me rephrase it. But what do godly people do? They get up. The ungodly people go, no, I fell. I fell. And I fell, and I'm not getting up because that hurt to fall. I was sitting there thinking about when we were at Red River, and that's the first time Bree walked. And she got up, and we were all, we were a little surprised. She got up when she did, and she started walking across the room. And here we are, and we're trying to make sure she doesn't hit something like this or hit something like this. You know, when she'd fall on a Reposaurus X, I never saw her crying. I never saw her getting upset. I saw her going like this, looking at me and her mom. And she got back up. And she fell again. And she got back up and she fell again. And she walks. And you walk. And my son walks. And everybody I know walks. Because they got back up. That's what righteous people do. They get up. And the reason they get up is because of an illustration found in Zechariah chapter 3. And it's, it was a vision that Zechariah got to see. It's one of my favorites. When I found this, man, I couldn't let go of this. And what happens is you've got Zechariah seeing Joshua, the son of Shealtiel, the high priest, not the, not the leader of the children of Israel. And he is filthy. When I saw that filthy, all I can remember was a picture I have or my mom's got when I was a basketball and I refused to take a bath. And you could see the grime on my on my hands and thumbs. When I started taking a bath, kind of doing like that, you know what? The grime went away. <laughs> He's filthy. And there is Satan standing to oppose him. Do you know what the name Satan means? Slanderer. You know what the word slander means? Saying something not true. Devil comes from the word diablos. Now don't think, go home thinking I'm calling the old Paso, based, the old El Paso baseball team when they were the diablos that they're the devils. That's not what I'm talking about. But he's literally there to deceive and steal. And here's Joshua, the high priest, and he's filthy. And before Satan can get one word out of his mouth, the angel of the Lord says, it's a capital A. Well, I need to remind you who that is. That's Jesus saying, the Lord rebuke you. The Lord rebuke you. Change his clothes. Give him a bath. And Zechariah says, well, put, put a clean turban on his head. They put a clean turban on his head. And the symbolism is Joshua is Israel to God. Filthy. But because they've repented of some of their ways and doing what God wants, God says, I'll clean you up. And I'm not going to listen. To the devil because philippians chapter 3 verse 12 through 14 says oh i haven't attained perfection i haven't attained completion but one thing i do verse 13 i forget the things in the past and i literally strain the greek word when he says i press toward the prize the the greek word is i strain with everything i've got I strain with everything I got for the prize of the upward call of God. 
Now, I don't want you to leave, leave Philippians 3 without this one thought. Why would Paul say first to forget the things that are in the past? Because who's always reminding us of the past? Did Paul have a past? You know he did. I mean, he tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 on down. He tells us in Philippians 3 what he had done. It isn't that he forgot it, what he'd ever done. He says, I, 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 there was no better Pharisee than me, no better, per, no better person of God than me, but I persecuted the way. I tried to kill Jesus. I tried to kill the way. And he said, what I refuse to do is I refuse to let all those things keep me from what God intended. Is not Acts 9, 15 true when he says go, when he told Ananias, go for he's a chosen vessel of mine. Um, Jesus, don't you think you could have chose somebody better than Paul? Uh, don't you think you could have chosen somebody better than Paul? Who wrote most of the New Testament books? Who do we call the apostle Paul? We barely call Peter the apostle Peter. And I know it's a habit we get into. Don't get me wrong. Oh, we love Paul. I mean, Paul's regarded as the greatest Christian. I don't know if I'd agree with that, and I don't think Paul would either. But he was right up there. Because he refused to let this stuff hold him back. So what do we know? The battle belongs to the Lord. Go to verse 20. Now, because of this, King Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah, son of Amoz, prayed and cried out to the Lord. Then the Lord just sat back and he did nothing. And he just let Sennacherib do whatever he wanted. No, he didn't. Sometimes I, I fear that's what I think Jesus is doing. Sometimes I fear that that's what I think God is doing. He's doing absolutely nothing when in reality, what is he doing? Look with me, please, again. Verse 21. Then the Lord sent an angel who cut down every mighty man of valor and captain in the camp of the king of Assyria. So he returned shamefaced to his own land. And when he got into the temple of his own God, some of his own offspring. Second Kings chapters, chapter 19 tells us Jesus went in and in one night killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. And two of Sennacherib's sons assassinated him. Because see, to whom does the battle belong? Lord. That's what he told Jehoshaphat. Now, are we in a war today? Second Chronicle, or uh, go to Ephesians chapter six. Sorry. Verse 22 says, thus the Lord saved Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem from the hand of the king of Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, and from the hand of all others and guided them on every side and many gifts were brought to the Lord at Jerusalem in presence to Hezekiah, the king of Judah, so that he was exalted in the sight of all the nations. Do Are we in a war today? Here's, here's what is so frustrating to us. We're in a war that we did not start. I don't have time to go through all of it. Will in another time. But Revelation 12 tells us we're in a war. The first part of the of Revelation 12, that covenant people of God, I know it's easy to call her Mary, but that's not Mary. That's the covenant people of God. That's the Old Testament brought us to Christ. First thing that happens, that child is born. And what's Satan trying to do? Satan's trying to kill him. What did Herod try to do? When God protected him, sent him down to Egypt. When Herod died, the angel says, those that were trying to kill Jesus, you can go back to, you can go back. You can go back to Nazareth. And he goes to Nazareth and he grows up there. And what were they trying to do on several occasions? They're going to take and stone him to death, huh? 
and they tried everything that he tried everything he could to destroy the child and a war breaks out in heaven this war breaks out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the, the dragon and his angels, and it's not a very big fight. The, uh, Michael and his angels win. Because you see, what he's trying to do is he's trying to keep Jesus from ascending back to the Father, trying to keep him from being resurrected from the dead. Because you see, Paul says if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, we're still in our sins. We're just as lost as we were yesterday. And so he couldn't get Jesus. And so what does he try to do? He tries to get the church. That's the second part. That's the second woman listed in Revelation 12. It's the New Testament. And he spews this awful spew. And the earth opens up and swallows the spew. You can't destroy the church. Nobody can destroy the church. Because you can't destroy Jesus. You can pick off congregations, and that's what he's done. But you can't destroy the church. And so what does he do? He says, I'm going to make war on the offspring. Who are the offspring of the church? Individual Christians. And it is a war we didn't pick, but it's a war we can fight. Not by ourselves. Look at verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, uh, the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of weakness in the heavenly places. Verse 13, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take in the shield of faith with which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints and for me that utterance may be given to me that I may openly bowl my mouth. Uh, I'm sorry, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in chains that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And let me show you the power of God real quick. Only two of these weapons listed are offensive weapons but they're also offensive weapons. The first one is the word of God. Satan can't beat the word of God. You want to impress the devil? He's not impressed with how much you know. He's not impressed with how much education you got. He's not impressed with how you're dressed. He's impressed with scripture. And the second one is prayer. The second one is prayer. Oh, I don't know why he keeps talking about it. what an absolute waste of time. I have prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and, prayed and God didn't do anything. Oh, really? Do a Christian man who was so upset because he thought God had abandoned him. Till I look till I started looking at what he had. He's got a gorgeous house. He's got several acres of land. He's got a pickup that was in the envy of everybody that, that knew him. Now, he, he wasn't arrogant. Don't get me wrong. He didn't go around flaunting stuff. He just got what he needed. And I told him, I said, the Lord hadn't blessed you. I got a challenge for you. And the challenge is also for you. If you don't think the Lord has blessed you, start going through and cleaning your house. I heard people say in this congregation, the Lord hadn't blessed us much. Let me tell you, we pulled out two and a half tons of fire hazard material. Two and a half tons of paper that wasn't being used and, and stuff that, that was in under the building. And, and, and look, I, I love saving stuff and hoarding stuff almost. My family can tell you that. I, I had a granny that always told you we may use that. We may need that. <laughs> 
But sometimes things, the same thing happens spiritually. We get so blessed that we get so much in our spiritual repertoire that we, that we turn around and say, like the people of old, God said, I've loved you. And we say, in what way have you loved us? All I see is problems. All I see is this, this, this. It's a battle. It's a battle. It's a battle that the Lord will win. Now, what he wants is for us to sit back and watch what he does. I reminded my mother yesterday. I said, you know what was so crazy to me about Jehoshaphat listening to God? She said, what? And I said, he said, you just sit there and watch what I'm about to do. And it took them four days, four days to collect all the spoil that God had given them. Four days. All I could hear somebody in the United States saying, well, forget it. Just leave it right there. I'm not going to spend four days doing it. Because <laughs> the battle belongs to the Lord. Years ago, there's a group of Christian people in Malawi. And I'll always have a special place in my heart for them for doing one particular song. You see, the song goes, Sio Shui Dam Bizangu, Bila Dama Yaka Yesu, Hapendeze We Mungu, Bila Dama Yaka Yesu, Hakuna Kabisa, Dawaya Makosa, Yakutu Takusa, Bila Dama Yaka Yesu. Guess what? You didn't know it, did you? You didn't have a clue. You, you kind of got an idea because what you're seeing is 454. But see, those people started singing it in Swahili. Sio shui bambi zangu, bila damayake yesu. Hapendeze wi mungu, bila damayake. Yesu hakuna kabisa dawa ya makosa ya kutu takusa bila dama yake Yesu you see what we learn is the battle belongs to the Lord he's overcome not he will overcome he's overcome the enemy the enemy is defeated. But he doesn't want you and I to know that. He wants you and I to think that he's still formidable. Oh, he is when we're by ourselves. But you see, he's very impressed, very impressed with the blood of Jesus Christ. And this morning, if you're here, and in whatever struggle you might have, we can serve you in some way to help you get home. Let us do it while we sing. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon, this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. So oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. 
Not of good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. 86. Eighty-six. By Christ redeemed in Christ restored, we keep the memory adored and show the death of our dear Lord until he come. His body given in our stead is seen in this memorial bread, and so our feeble love is fed until he come. His fearful unknown agony, his life blood shed for us we see. The wine shall tell the mystery until he come. And thus that dark betrayal night with the last advent we unite by one bright chain of loving right until he come. And Father, we do thank you for that memorial feast in which you, your son instituted it. And he took bread that night and he gave thanks. <clears throat> he instituted that supper by saying, this is my body broken for you. Thus do in remembrance of me. Father, that is our intent to do. And it's in Jesus we pray. Amen. Two hundred eighty two. Two hundred eighty two. I know that my Redeemer lives and ever prays for me. I know eternal life he gives from sin and sorrow free. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life he gives. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. He wills that I should wholly be in word and thought, indeed. Then I his holy face may see when from this earth life freed. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life he gives. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that unto sinful man a saving grace is nigh. 
I know that he will come again to take me home on high. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life he gives. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that over yonder stands a place prepared for me, a home that's not made with hands most wonderful to see. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life he gives. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. And Father, we thank you that we have a Redeemer. It cost him his blood. And his blood purchased us, redeemed us, forgiven us, chosen us, sealed us, made us acceptable, and made us the beloved. Father, we thank you that Jesus said after the supper, drink from it, all of you, for this is for the remission, the forgiveness of sins. Father, we have been forgiven. Thank you so much, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Number 40. <clears throat> Number 40. Be with me, Lord, I cannot live without thee. I dare not try to take one step alone. I cannot bear the loads of life unaided. I need thy strength to lean myself upon. Be with me, Lord, and then if dangers threaten, if storms of trial burst above my head, if lashing seas leave everywhere about me, they cannot harm nor make my heart afraid. Be with me, Lord, no other gift or blessing thou couldst bestow could with this one compare. A constant sense of thy abiding presence, where'er I am, to feel that thou art near. Be with me, Lord, when loneliness o'ertakes me, when I must weep amid the fires of pain. And when shall come the hour of my departure for worlds unknown? Oh, Lord, be with me then. And Father, we do thank you for the day in which you've given to us the many wonderful blessings that we too often take for granted. We thank you that the battle belongs to you. If we will stand in you and in the power of your might, we can win. Father, thank you for some or so many that have been ill that are doing much better. Sometimes we don't celebrate our, our victories and the answers to yes to prayers. And Father, forgive us for that. But there are some that still need our prayers. We concentrate a lot of times on those individuals. And to a point, we should. Father, help them. Help us in any way that we can to be a, a blessing to them. And Father, we just thank you for the greatest blessing of all. That is your son, Jesus. Thank you that we have been made acceptable to you through him. And we come to you this morning through him. 
Amen. Thank you all for being here this morning. Where to go? Thank you. You got it. Thank you. You got Have it. Have a good one. Well, you too. Bye. Bye.